40 Days and 40 Nights by Keegan Wildman Wendell. Chapter 1. The 22nd of Nisan, 5781. Journey begins. On the first day of the week, on the 22nd day of Nisan, in the year 5781, I packed up some of my belongings in my Honda Suka to go be with the Lord Yahshua for 40 days and 40 nights. I had scoped out a campsite in the Everglades, which is a little under two hours southwest of where I'm staying. Two days later, I haphazardly stuffed my car with a folding table, CD cassette player, CDs, tapes, Bibles, other books, the Hebrew calendar, three-gallon filtered water dispenser, one-man tent, eight-foot by eight-foot instant canopy, bicycle, mellophone, saxophone, bass guitar, silent stroke drum kit, clothes, bedding material, notebook, pens, laptop, computer, and miscellaneous hardware and tools. Before leaving, I made sure my efficiency was spick and span. I organized the space and washed the dishes and swept and mopped the floors. Daniela, my landlady, was working in the backyard, placing square yard stones around the perimeter of the other freshly laid square tiles that she had hired some workers to install. They had just finished the day prior, and it looked lovely. I had everything packed up except a couple of bags, and when Danielle asked me if I could help her move a few heavy stacks of shingles, I hopped to it. They are too heavy for me. We picked it up together and moved it under the porch. After the cooperative shuffle, she seemed already winded, and I was already racing back to get the next one, and naturally picked it up on my own to bring it back to where she was. Are you sure? Of course. I've worked in construction as an industrial electrician. (laughs) This is nothing. After helping her with this little chore, I asked her if there was anything else she needed. That was all she needed. I made double sure that everything was packed, and then I went back and reaffirmed my endeavor to spend 40 days and 40 nights away from the efficiency I was renting from her. I will be praying for you, and Rodney, and Sarah, and Bruce Wayne. Rodney is her 20-something-year-old son, and Sarah is her daughter-in-law. Bruce Wayne is her one-year-old grandson. Bruce is Rodney and Sarah's baby boy. Rodney loves Batman. Bruce Wayne is the legal name of the masked action hero of old. It is well known what happened to Bruce as a young boy. I hope the baby Bruce Wayne I know now doesn't suffer the trials and pains to the extent that Batman did growing up. I gave Daniela a hug and a holy kiss and wished her adieu. And then a little way off, I prayed to Abba Father before beginning my journey. Heavenly Father, Lord Yahshua, Holy Spirit, thank you for this journey you are leading me through. I pray that you order my steps and clear out the trail ahead of me. I pray for divine appointments and for your will to be done and for me to receive visions of what I am to do for the rest of my time here. In your mighty name, Yahshua HaMashiach, and Yahweh the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. What was the purpose of this excursion into the wilderness? I wanted to experience something similar to what my Lord and Savior did after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, led him into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. That means I decided I would fast, and I began my fast on the Sabbath of the 21st of Nisan. I felt I was being called to something greater than what I was currently doing. I'm in between jobs and taking care of financially, and I thank God for that every day. However, to whom much is given, much is required. And in 2 Spider-Man 1, verse 8, it is stated that with great power comes great responsibility. I knew I had to do something. Time is running out, and I long day and night to do something that will allow me to hear those words every true disciple loves to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were responsible for a few things. I now place you in charge of many. Come and enjoy your master's happiness with me. I pulled up my Honda Suka, arriving at Midway Camp in the Everglades into spot number 9. I had registered the spot by calling the toll-free number the very day I had scoped it out. I began unloading my mess in the car by stacking my books and bags and everything onto and around my designated picnic table. I noticed that the tent stake I tried to drive in the ground was striking something hard and would not be driven down any further. I made it about four or maybe five inches deep and then I took the stake out and poked around to find other areas that would be more satisfactory. It was all pretty much the same anywhere I struck. I was mildly frustrated and this was not the first time I felt this way. I reassured myself that all things work out for the good of those who love Christ and pray to the Lord Yahshua for guidance, and I asked him to bless and consecrate the ground anyway. I picked a spot and worked it over. The one-man tent was up, and I got the bigger 8-foot-by-8-foot canopy started, and since the ground was still riddled with mysterious hard objects, I decided to hammer the stakes in as far as they would go, and then bang the remaining segments so that they bent over the other ends of the footholds. This was satisfactory. 
The wind would have to work hard to blow this structure down. Do you know why? Because I prayed for the Lord to bless and consecrate the ground. Remember that. The tent and the canopy were erected and completed. I assembled my bedding and unfolded the table and drum kit and grabbed some potable water and snapped some pictures. Everything looked good. Some campers were walking by. It was an eastern Indian lady and her teenage son. Can we dance to your music? She had a flirtatious lilt to her voice. I knew her son was probably cringing. It would be hard to hear it, miss. This is a silent stroke drum kit, and I brought it here because I knew it wouldn't cause a disturbance to the other campers. She pouted fictitiously, and we proceeded to converse. And then a little later, the conversation somehow got onto the topic of God. Did you know there is a God, one God, that he sent his son to die on the cross so that you don't have to? Oh yeah, it's true. He walked this earth the same way you and I did, only perfectly. I don't believe in that God. She was getting testy. I believe in a creator, but it wouldn't do that. Her sunglasses were white and goofy, and she carried a drink in her hand. It looked like a coffee and cream. It might have been a Kalula or maybe an Irish cream with whiskey. It? Is your God in it? Is it an inanimate object like this stop sign? That doesn't make much sense, miss. How can something inanimate create something animated? My God has a personality. He is Yahweh. He is the author and finisher of everything known and unknown to mankind. She wasn't having any of it. I had the impression she was a Hindu or maybe a Buddhist. Her son was acknowledging me with a veiled reverence, so I began to address him now. Young man, remember this. There is a God. One God. His name is Yahweh. He sent his son Yahshua to die and to be resurrected for you so that you may inherit everlasting life. He gave you and your mother free will. It is easy to believe whatever you want. Your mother believes she can do whatever she wants, and this goes against her own best interest that God has in store for her. She is denying God as sovereign of the universe and that he created her and knows everything about her. He loves her and he loves you. Yahweh is omnipresent. He is everywhere at once. He is omnipotent, meaning he is all-powerful. And he is omniscient. He is all-knowing. It is hard to listen to the truth sometimes and it is especially hard to follow Yahshua. He said the pathway to heaven is a narrow gate. But big and wide is the highway leading to eternal destruction. The lady sarcastically wished me a nice evening, and I authentically did the same, while proclaiming more of the truth as she and her son walked away vigorously. I noticed she was wearing a shirt with the Playboy Bunny insignia, and was sure to make her aware of that, notating for her and the benefit of her son that pornography is evil. Today is the day of the Easter Bunny and the pagan goddess of fertility in accordance to the manifold pagan traditions under different guises. I prayed when they were far off. Lord Yahshua, I don't know if that was the right way to go about that. I was honest in how I felt, and I felt I may have been self-righteous in my resolve. Perhaps his love was not coming across in an effective manner. I cleared things up between myself and him and continued getting things done. A couple drove up and parked across the way in spot number 10. He was already yelling, When does the band start? I affected a pseudo-confused state to formulate my thoughts. Band? He pointed at the drum set. Yes, when does the music start? He grimaced and grinned. It's only me. I'm a one-man band, so whenever I feel like it, I guess. He laughed. A little while later, another couple with their big RV pulled through the front entrance and the man shouted from the driver's seat, When does the band start playing? I patiently replied the same thing I said moments earlier. The couple across the way at number 10 laughed and the man's old lady there smiled at me. Have you been getting this all day? I told her that her old man was the first and the gentleman in the RV was the second. There was laughter all around. The man at number 10 asked me which way I came off 41. This is the road that stretches for countless miles past airboat tour offers and gift shops in a long stretch of canals on either side. I pointed the direction I came from, and he confirmed that he arrived the same way. He was in his 50s, him and his wife. And he reminded me of a friend of mine in high school, Matt Laporta. The last time I saw Matt, he was sitting in his work truck. The inmates Matt was in charge of were on duty cleaning up the side of the road. It was the 441 extension in West Palm Beach, Florida. The conversation I had with him that day was not dissimilar to the one I was about to have with this gentleman. I engaged the older Matt Laporta. Where are you from, sir? North Carolina. We are headed to Naples and then the Keys. 
It was only a matter of time before we got around to the thing that really matters, Yahshua. He asked me how long I was planning on staying here, after learning it was my first time in the Everglades. Well, I plan on staying for 40 days and 40 nights, you know, like Jesus did. Oh, well, this is the perfect day to start because it's Easter. I don't celebrate Easter. Huh? Easter is a pagan holiday, sir. And it gets its name after a pagan goddess of fertility. You cannot find any mention of this holiday in the sacred scriptures or in the New Testament. The man was intrigued as I began to share with him the insights I had collected via the Holy Spirit over the year I began my journey with Yahshua the year before. January the 26th, 2020. He seemed to agree with everything I told him, but at the same time I could sense that he was a bit perplexed. There was a sadness in his eyes, as I told him how Yahshua said there will be many who will perform signs and wonders and healings in his name, believing they are doing the work of the Holy Spirit, only for them to hear, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He wished me a blessed night. And I thanked him saying shalom. I explained that the word shalom was given to the Israelites as a salutation and as a pleasant exchange of greeting and departure. Shalom, as I understand it, means the peace that surpasses all human understanding. This I left him with, and I made a mental note to keep him in prayer. They would be leaving the next day. Everything was set up and the sun was beginning to decline. A man was walking and stopping to observe the campers intermittently. As he drew in closer, I thought I recognized him from the day I came to check the place out. Are you the host? No, just another handsome guy, chuckled. You could be his brother. The chuckling man is an engineer from New Jersey. He told me he worked for RCA for 40 years and I was impressed. He was here on a trip because his wife wanted to visit. He apologized to me when he told me he wasn't a fan of South Florida. Then we started talking about Arizona. This was an area he especially loved to visit. The reason why? When he was 18 years old, his old man and him went on the road trip across the USA. Everyone else in their family didn't enjoy traveling, so they hit the open road together. It was just the two of them. His dad had passed away 10 years ago. The man explained that his dad was a brilliant character, extremely intelligent, and during his last days it was hard for the man to see his father become so feeble in his mental faculties. His father was a sailor for an oil ship, and there were things he never knew about his dad that were later relayed in the self-same trip to Arizona. With nothing to pass the time but idle chatter, his dad seemed to want to pass along a nugget of information about himself that he needed to get off his chest. I'm a lefty, and my friends love to play baseball. I couldn't play because my friends didn't have a glove for me to use. One day, my dad gave me a left-handed baseball glove. He casually explained that it once belonged to an old friend of his. On that trip, he learned who the left-handed baseball glove belonged to. His Navy veteran dad worked on an industrial ship with big tanks of oil that needed to be cleaned after they had been emptied. In the bottom of the tanks were drains and these would accumulate leftover oil and a sediment. To clean it, a few workers needed to climb down with a flashlight and scoop the stuff up and mop it. The best friend of the dad in this story was one of the few workers who was on duty to climb in and clean the tanks deep inside. He dropped his flashlight, shattering the glass and exposing the filament to the oil, causing an explosion. The danger was imminent. The peril, inescapable. There was no hope for these three trapped workers. The only way to put out the fire and prevent the whole ship from being destroyed and taking out the whole crew was to cover the tank back up with its lid. My dad was the one to do that, and knowing and hearing that the screams and pleadings of the three men in the tank would be their last, he did it anyway. His best friend, the guy who dropped the flashlight, was one of them. Needless to say, I was quite bummed after hearing this recounting. It triggered a Holy Spirit response within me to share a message of hope from our Heavenly Father to this man. His name was Tim. Tim, I have heard a lot of stories like yours and have learned plenty of things. He was in his retirement years. He worked at RCA since 1979. By my calculation, he had just retired a couple of years ago. Do you agree that no matter how old you are, you will never be done learning? Yes. Right, and I've learned some things from you just now. And you can learn some things from me. As a matter of fact, I bet you learned some things from your kids right after they just learned to speak. That's right. Well, I have a burden for you, Tim, and I would like to share some knowledge with you. I read something somewhere that said, life is a lesson, so take good notes. He grinned. (laughs) All right, go for it. You know in popular science they say matter can neither be created nor destroyed? Yes. 
Inside of us there is something that is immortal. It can't be created nor destroyed by any human. Within this particular vessel we call the human body there is a driver and that is our soul. I believe we are here for a reason and that everything happens for a reason. Do you believe that? No. Well, do you believe in absolute truth? No. So, you believe in relative truth? Yes. That is a dangerous way of looking at things. By this time, the mosquitoes were out in force, biting his legs and buzzing across our faces. He smacked them distractedly, murmuring under his breath. You know, if there's no such thing as absolute truth, then there's no reason to obey the laws of the land. You are giving everyone on the planet carte blanche to go ahead and commit their very worst. Yes, that's right. And yet, people should not be able to do whatever they want to do. Yes. Yet, you don't believe in absolute truth. No. You are contradicting yourself. I tend to do that. Do you know what cognitive dissonance is, Tim? He started smacking his legs, yelping. I'm getting eaten! The sun was just about all the way down. Just one more thing. Do you know what cognitive dissonance is? No. It's when you have an inconsistent belief system. You should look into that, Tim. Atheism is a faith based on no faith at all, which is cognitive dissonance. He was walking away, muttering some things that I knew were objections, but I couldn't hear them. I could only think to tell him that God is real and he would meet him one day. I immediately went to my tent and prayed for Tim. It was the beginning of bedtime, so I wound myself down getting into my routine for the evening. I got my Bible out and prayed for the Lord Yahshua to guide me through the reading. I decided to read the two epistles from Kepha, Peter the Apostle. But I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir up by a reminder, knowing that the putting off of my tent is soon, even as Athan Yahshua HaMashiach made clear to me. And I shall do my utmost also to see to it that you always have a reminder of these after my departure. 2 Peter 1, verses 13-15 through I was reminded of how the majority of the world's tent dwellers will be slanderers and mockers and workers of defeat and unrighteousness. Those who set up traps to gain what is not theirs, but unwittingly set a trap against themselves, and this is what I feel is powered by the fuel of cognitive dissonance and the stiff-necked attitude of self-defeatism. I prayed and slept through my first night of the journey.